So today I'm going to talk about some, a, a topic which other people have touched on, notably uh, Dan Mace, first thing this morning, uh, a field we call digital coatings. Um, uh, first of all, the, uh, uh, I'll, I'll cover TTP, the obligatory plug for the company I work for. I'll try to summarize where traditional inkjet is now. And uh, the problem with doing that at a conference like this is that it, is, is that it tends to move slightly. And uh, it probably moved slightly this morning. Uh, we heard some innovations from Seiko and, and Tsar, which, which move what they can do into this territory. Um, then I'll discuss the, the, the gap we perceive, the technology gap we perceive, and some new technologies available from TTP and others uh, which play in this space. Um, finally, I'm going to touch upon some, just some examples of markets um, and, uh, and then wrap up. So TTP, there are many people in the room who've worked with us. Um, fundamentally, we uh, are a technology and product development company based, unsurprisingly, near Cambridge in the UK. Uh, we're about 400 people, and in our 30-year existence, uh, we've continually been working on digital printing products and applications, uh, ranging from uh, thermal label printers through to industrial inkjet systems. So we have expertise in uh, all the inkjet technologies, drop and demand, continuous, uh, LED technologies, electrostatic, you name it, we've worked on it. And you can see here, just for interest, uh, in, the, in the center, that picture is, is uh, a product that we did in 1992. Uh, some people who are smiling in the room who are aware of it. It uses HP's original TIG1 technology. So that, that's an inkjet pen we did for the Zebra Pen Company in Japan. 12 nozzles, 96 DPI, if I remember correctly. Um, and that was, uh, that was the first inkjet printer we developed at TTP. On the left is something uh, we're doing now using Ricoh GH2220 print heads. So that's a low cost, uh, uh, full color UV cure uh, modular system that we're configuring for different applications for different customers. So just to attempt to summarize, with apologies to, to the various other print head manufacturers here, um, the status of, of traditional piezo drop on demand inkjet right now. Um, as you've been hearing, as you'll be aware, it's continuing to grow into many decorative markets, um, textiles being uh, perhaps one that's growing fast at the moment, as well as packaging. Um, and the print heads on the whole uh, have moved in a direction of smaller and smaller drop sizes, higher and higher resolution, higher and higher firing frequency, um, which is what sectors like production document printing, textile printing, um, even ceramic tile printing require. There are exceptions. Um, you know, people like Zara uh, uh, have developed recirculating ink print heads for the ceramic tile market, so that's a very specific industrial niche. Um, and, but, but in general, most of the development you'll have been hearing about um, in the past couple of days is towards smaller droplets, higher speed, higher resolution. And there's good growth in, uh, if you, anyone heard the Mayor Berger talk yesterday, there's good growth in you know, truly um, novel industrial niches uh, with these technologies where the fluid fits the print head. The other end of the spectrum in terms of resolution, drop size, viscosity uh, of fluid being processed, there's valve jet. And valve jet's been around arguably longer than any of these other technologies. Um, it's still used widely for coding and marking, these kinds of low resolution applications. And a number of people have kind of adapted it for things like textiles on, on coatings, people like Zimmer make printers which will apply textile coatings uh, using multi-nozzle valve jet heads. So just to try and summarize what we perceive as a, as a technology gap graphically, and, and apologies, this is PowerPoint, this is uh, not particularly accurate, but if we have print resolution on the vertical axis and what we might call um, ink complexity or ink difficulty on the horizontal axis, so that's, that's higher viscosity and higher particulate size, either or, both of these things independently are difficult for, for inkjet print heads. Um, you can see the coding and marking space, market space, is down there, relatively low resolutions, and most of the products are using um, low viscosity solvent-based inks. For the more decorative markets, We're seeing much higher, as I say, much higher print resolutions, native nozzle resolutions, um, and we're still working on the whole with low viscosity inks 
um, you know, particulate sizes up to a couple of microns maximum. There are a whole range of other applications. If you, uh, if you saw Dan Macy's talk earlier, you know, he was talking about precisely this. Applications such as industrial coatings, paints, adhesives, sealants, um, and of course additive manufacturing, where there's a need to digitally apply much higher viscosity fluids or fluids with much larger particulates, tens of microns in size, and some of these fluids combine both those two unpleasant attributes, unpleasant from a, an inkjet point of view. And just to put a couple of numbers on it, I, I, I'm suggesting that the sort of conventional inkjet capability right now tends to top out with inks that are around 20 centipoise at room temperature um, and, and particle sizes of two microns. And uh, I have to apologize because we heard this morning from, uh, from Angus and Yoshi, Zara and Seiko, they both talked uh, about high viscosity fluids and that, albeit I think at, at slightly elevated temperatures. So the traditional technology is pushing to the right and valve jet technology um, is, is low resolution, low firing frequency, but if you apply enough pressure behind a, a valve jet nozzle, you can push just about anything through it. So, the, so you really can deal with some very heavily viscous fluids um, and uh, particulates with valve jet, but you're limited to low resolution and low speed. So that's the opportunity space we see. It's quite large, and a number of people have talked about it over the past couple of days. What's TTP doing about it? The, our, our, our response to it is a, is a print head we call Vista. Um, it's fundamentally different. I mean, it, it, it might look uh, a little like a traditional drop-on-demand piezo print head, but it's fundamentally different in the way we create droplets. So uh, as, you, as you will have heard at the various keynotes the last couple of days, um, traditional piezo or thermal drop-on-demand print heads tend to have a chamber behind each nozzle and a relatively constricted fluid path between reservoir and chamber. Um, and, and droplets are created by constricting the nozzle in some way or by creating a bubble within that chamber. Um, the fundamental difference with our technology is, is that we create a droplet by flexing the nozzle plate itself. So there is no chamber structure behind each nozzle and the fluid can flow freely behind the nozzle plate. And that means uh, we are capable of processing um, more viscous fluids. The other useful attribute of, of having a, a, a nozzle plate, an actual nozzle plate vibrating at an ultrasonic frequency, um, is that the system is self-cleaning. If there are particulates inside the print head that are too large to pass through a nozzle, they won't stick. There are, there are no chambers for them to get lodged in, and the nozzle plate is constantly bouncing them around, literally. So the head, with, a, with, with the fact that the ink is recirculating and the nozzle plate is vibrating, is very robust and doesn't clog easily. So uh, this video will start in a minute. Just to try and illustrate the principle of operation, that, that those of you who are aware of uh, issues of mechanical crosstalk in print heads will have realized that we, 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 if, if we just had an array of nozzles in a single contiguous nozzle plate, uh, when we attempted to fire one, we have a terrible problem with the one next door. So we actually have slots in between our nozzles. So if you think of each nozzle, as being on a finger of material. Um, and if, if we could start the video now, this will uh, zoom in and cross section and show you how, uh, obviously this is an artist's impression, the motion is massively exaggerated, but you get an idea of how the motion of the finger up into the ink, because of the inertia of the ink, begins to form a droplet. And then the downstroke, when we add some kinetic energy, the droplet breaks off. Um, the physicist in the room will be aware that it's not quite that simple. Um, but that's, that's the basic principle. So what can we do with that? Um, we currently, with, with heads we're currently building in our labs, we are operating uh, with fluid temperature in the print head at up to 140 degrees C. Obviously that helps uh, reduce the viscosity of many fluids. Um, and we're able to eject 50 micron particulates through 80 micron nozzles. Normally, the rule of thumb would be, you know, if you, if you, if you want to put a particulate-laden ink through a nozzle, you'd want your nozzle diameter traditionally to be three or four times the diameter of the particle. Because we have a, a vibrating nozzle, this self-cleaning action, we're able to run uh, a, a much better ratio. So with 80 micron nozzles, we can pass 50 micron particles. And we've ejected uh, new Newtonian fluids, which are 50 centipoise at room temperature. 
okay? Um, clearly, that reduces as you increase the printhead temperature. Um, because of the way the printhead operates, we create a lot of shear at the nozzle. So paint in particular and other fluids which shear thin, uh, we can process very easily. And that means that we've, we've ejected fluids which are at hundreds or even thousands of centipoids at low shear. When they're running through our head and when they're being ejected, the high shear environment they, they experience brings, as long as it brings that viscosity down to something like 50 centipoise um, at room temperature, we can eject them. And we've worked with solid loadings uh, up to and around 45%. So uh, you know, very heavily sedimenting inks are feasible. Um, if, I think most people were probably at Dan Mace's talk, the first talk this morning, so he, he talked all about this technology. It's another response uh, to the same market opportunity space. Um, I'm under very strict instructions. I'm Guy and Dan, they're both in the room checking. Uh, all I'm allowed to say is that it's a non-contact technology. Is that good? Yeah. It's low waste and it deposits existing coating formulations. And the guys are, uh, have, a, have a booth at the back if you want to talk more about that one. Um, the other interesting technology in this area uh, is a company called Alchemy, Alan Hudd's uh, company. Many of you will know Alan. Uh, I don't believe they're here. I don't believe they're represented. But Jetronica, uh, you can probably see from the, from the photograph, um, consists of an, of an array of needles. Um, each needle, you can't quite, you maybe can see in the sort of blackness behind them, each needle has a, has a, a piezo actuator attached to it. And uh, the system works by creating a standing wave in the needle. Um, and then literally flicking drops uh, from the orifice that you can see at the end of each needle. Um, so uh, again, I'm kind of reading from script here, but this, this, is, this is considered to be very high productivity, high flow rate technology, low cost, simple. Um, as you can see, the, resol the native resolution is, is quite low, um, but high liquid flow and drop volumes up to 50 microliters, so really quite high. Particle size is over 100 microns. So really up into this, uh, this difficult fluid space. So just to summarize that technology gap, this, this is you know, a gross generalization. There are, there are uh, technologies and print heads that kind of slightly uh, fall outside these, these boundaries. But on the whole, traditional inkjet, we're talking about hundreds of nozzles per inch, even over 1,000 nozzles per inch. Uh, we're talking about droplet sizes from below one picoliter up to tens. Now, I think uh, Zara and Seiko this morning talked about 200, actually, so that, that uh, boundary is being pushed. Um, firing rates measured in tens of kilohertz, um, you know, up to, up to and above 100 kilohertz, but with an ink range currently that's highly restricted, very low viscosity and very small particulates, you know, one or two microns max. Um, where we're playing, Vista, uh, we're, we are, because of our, our slots between our nozzles, our native resolution is lower than with traditional drop on demand. So we're talking about tens of nozzles per inch, typically 50, 60 nozzles per inch, that kind of area. We're working with drop sizes, typically two or 300 picoliters. Um, we, can, we can go down to tens of picoliters, and we're running our heads at between five and 10 kilohertz. Um, we can, as, as discussed, eject a wide range of fluid rheologies. Then at, at, at the other end of the spectrum, valve jet, typically these print heads have single numbers of nozzles per inch. So you know, the, the, the spacing between nozzles is, is relatively large. They're dealing with um, droplet volumes between measured in sort of nanoliters to microliter volumes, and they're firing it up to about one, one kilohertz, so relatively low firing rate. But they can process a very wide range fluids indeed. Okay, so moving on to some of the specific markets, and, and I won't cover all of them, but uh, these, these are some uh, we're aware of and we're focusing on to, to one degree or another. Um, the first of these is 3D printing. Um, specifically within, the, of course, there are many 3D printing technologies, but specifically material jetting. And, uh, you know, companies like 3D Systems and uh, Stratasys already have very successful printer lines using uh, print heads from people like Ricoh uh, to directly jet material models. So you create, you create a layer of photopolymer, you UV cure it, you inkjet print the next layer, and that's how you build up your part. Um, 
it's a, it's, a, it's a great technique, it's gaining a lot of traction, but at the moment, because the fluid rheologies that can be processed are, again, a low viscosity, um, the parts that you end up with are only really suitable for, for, uh, as models or prototypes. They're not the kind, they don't have the kind of robustness and physical strength that, you'd need in a, uh, that you would see in, a, in an injection molded ABS or nylon component. The other benefit that this type of inkjet application has compared to you know, vat-based processes like stereolithography or powder-based technologies like selective laser sintering is that with inkjet you can make multi-material parts. So this is already happening. I think Stratasys, one of their products, you can make a part with 16 different materials included. So if you want to have a part which is partly rigid and partly uh, elastic, you can do that. And if you want to apply colors, you can do that. And you know, really, I think this is the future of, of all kinds of manufacturing. I don't think people, you know, mechanical engineers like me, uh, sitting down at CAD stations designing components, need to start thinking in a very different way to accommodate this technology. It's just in its infancy. And there are, there are two areas where people you know, really want to improve it. Uh, one, as with all additive manufacturing, is, is people want to improve speed. Uh, and we heard Zara talking this morning about how they're addressing that. Uh, the other area is people want to print, they want to directly print so-called end-user parts, production parts, parts with the physical robustness of nylon and ABS. Um, you can do that with filament deposition modeling, but that has accuracy drawbacks. So we're working currently, uh, I can't say very much about it at this juncture, maybe next year, we're work working currently on uh, inkjet printing with Vista at elevated temperatures, resins which have similar mechanical characteristics to ABS. So that, that will be real uh, in a couple of years' time. Another 3D printing technology uh, that's been around for a while is binder jetting. Um, X1 in the States are probably the biggest company uh, using uh, a bed of, of metal powder. They then inkjet print with a Dymatics print head, a binder onto that which holds it together. They call it a green part. Holds, sticks it together well enough to move it from the printer into a, a sintering oven where it becomes sintered to, to make a metal part. Um, there's a lot of interest now. Uh, everyone's used to printing binder in these machines. People now want to print binder with some additional functional particulate contained within it. So, for example, you might have a bed of aluminium powder or tungsten powder, and within the binder, you could add a second material locally, just in one area of the part. Currently not possible. Um, you might want to infill, if you, have a, if you have a bed of powder that's 50 micron, particles, you might want to infill some of the gaps and increase the density of the part by adding 10 micron particles in the binder. Um, and as I say, we have a couple of uh, research projects going on with universities uh, into this type of technology using Vista. Um, automotive paint. This clearly is a huge market. Currently, 15% of all vehicles being built, uh, rolling off production lines, are multicolored, uh, and the trend is uh, seen as increasing. So uh, uh, currently, if you visit an automotive paint, uh, paint shop, people are still using masking tape uh, and brown paper uh, alongside conventional spray technology. So it's a very manual process to create the breaks between the different color panels. Another factor uh, that I think Dan mentioned earlier is the inefficiency of traditional pressurized uh, spray technology. Something like 40% of the cost of painting a car is uh, the energy required to remove the paint that bounces back off the car and doesn't stick to it. So removing all that paint mist uh, and the energy involved in that, uh, as well as the actual paint you're wasting, uh, adds about 40% of the, of, of the cost of painting a car. So OEMs are searching, uh, all the car manufacturers and the paint manufacturers are searching for a system which is maskless, which can create sharp edges without masking tape, um, and which gives a high transfer efficiency. So something without the uh, sort of brute force approach of pressurized sprays where uh, droplets will land on the substrate and then just stay there without a percentage of them bouncing back off because they, they have too much energy. So inkjet has a role to play here. Um, uh, there is already work going on and, and perhaps the production solution given, given the volume of cars and the speed at which they're painted will be some kind of hybrid between traditional spray and uh, one of the technologies I'm talking about today. Another paint application is aerospace. Um, completed aircraft sit in a paint hangar, so they, they are, uh, you know, at that point in time, a sort of $200 million piece of inventory that Boeing or Airbus or whoever it might be really would like to get off their books. 
and earn some money from. They're, they're spending seven days in a paint hanger being painted. Um, it really is a uh, time-consuming process, and whenever the livery is anything other than monochrome, and nowadays, it, it, just about always, there is some kind of interesting graphic on an aircraft, uh, those, those graphics have to be applied by a mural painter in some instances, or using, as this person has, masking tape uh, and brown paper. And I, I've, I've visited aircraft paint hangers, they're amazing places, but to see brown paper and masking tape being used, same as I do when I decorate my kitchen, is kind of astonishing. But that, that's how it's done. Um, livery is, is, is you know, one of the major ways that uh, airlines can differentiate themselves. They're all flying very similar aircraft, so they all want interesting graphics on the aircraft, and they're also starting to sell advertising. So not only are aircraft painted when they're made, they are repainted quite regularly. Um, and things like decals work up to a point, but wear off very quickly, uh, you know, in the sort of six, 700 mile per hour wind speeds they experience. Um, so you can see on the left there, that's a sample of an aerospace paint, uh, you know, standard aerospace paint, not reformulated, printed with one of our print heads uh, onto stainless steel. Textiles, uh, as everyone in the room knows, uh, one of the sort of high growth areas for, for inkjet right now is production textile decoration. And as people move over to decorating textiles digitally, uh, the next thing they logically want to do is apply the coatings that have to be applied before decoration and after decoration digitally. Um, so you know, the drivers for, for digitally decorating textiles are well known, the incredibly short uh, supply chain that, that manufacturers are looking for, especially in the sort of fashion and sportswear industries, um, and, and general reduction of waste. Um, the, there are a, a range of pre-coatings that get applied. The, some of these are to improve the, the quality of the decoration that will come next. Some of them are to prevent any dye in the fabric from migrating through into the decoration. Um, and again, a, a huge range of post-treatments for added durability, for flame retardants, waterproofing, on sportswear, you know, people are starting to print elastomeric panels onto, onto garments. Um, and they call it functional. I'm not sure it's functional, but it's fashionable. People want it. Um, so th this is an enormous, enormous opportunity uh, for print heads which can process higher viscosity, um, stickier fluids, such as those used for, for waterproofing. And security printing is another area we're working in. Um, our, our customer is, uh, perhaps unsurprisingly in this industry, uh, very cautious about what we can say. Um, but the industry in general, uh, you know, a lot of ID card and bank card printing is moving from thermal transfer to inkjet tr using, using traditional inkjet technology. Um, we heard first thing this morning about the, the growth in tax stamps, um, anti-counterfeiting measures that are required for for example, cigarette packaging, pharmaceutical packaging. So there are new regulations coming in, which mean there's a boom in the need to print these uh, difficult to counterfeit unique stamps that are stuck to, stuck to products being shipped around. And uh, already with traditional inkjet print heads, there's a whole range of you know, UV and IR readable inks available. Um, and, and that can be done and is, is growing. Um, what we can bring with, with these new generation of print heads is uh, the, the, the ability to print larger particulates. So if you look on the, the bottom right image here, that's a color shifting ink. So depending on how the light falls on it, the, the, the color changes. Um, it has an obvious application in things like banknotes and other security documents. Um, and that, that involved uh, printing 50 micron flake particles. Uh, you won't get that kind of effect with uh, any other, with smaller particles because the light won't reflect in the same way. Um, and those were, were printed through one of our print heads. And the final market application I'm going to talk about is bioprinting. Um, th this is a bit like packaging printing. It's not one thing. It's an enormous range of, of niches, uh, ranging from 3D printing bone implants and tissue structures. And people are already talking about 3D printing um, living, uh, you know, working organs at some point in the not, not too distant future. So that's, that's one end of this, and a lot of that is done now with, uh, with print heads from the traditional uh, uh, print heads from, from the vendors you'll be aware of. Um, at the other end of the spectrum, uh, there's mass production of things like test strips for pregnancy testing. And just one example here I'm showing, which is an area we're working in. Um, this is a, a, a test slide 
Um, it has thousands of tiny uh, pixels in our terminology of reagent printed onto it. Each reagent is, is, is uh, used for a different diagnostic process. A sample from a patient, maybe, maybe uh, amplified DNA from a blood sample, then needs to be printed with accuracy so that you can literally conduct a different experiment on each pixel when you put it through a, through a diagnostic instrument. And currently these kinds of, uh, this is a booming technology area, these kinds of microarrays are, um, they're, they're made one spot at a time because that's where the industry, the industry is coming from pipettes uh, and sort of piezo droppers and higher volumes. Um, and these things, you know, a batch of these things takes hours to manufacture. So it's an absolutely, uh, it's, a, it's a real no-brainer for going digital. Um, the problem is that uh, some of the fluids being processed and some of the living uh, cell structures and so on within those fluids um, don't, don't appreciate being squeezed through tightly constrained print heads. So I think uh, we're reaching a conclusion just about on time. Um, market size, uh, customers don't like telling people like us, their, their subcontractors, uh, much about the size of their markets because they're worried we'll work out how valuable our work is and charge them more for it. Um, so we have had difficulty uh, uh, getting data from our customers that, that I've been allowed to present here today. Um, so you know, th these are a few data points and do not cover the whole potential area, but they just cover a few niches here. Coatings, adhesives, and sealants. We've worked a lot with Covestro. That's in the public domain. Um, they put the, uh, the market for polyurethane coatings, adhesives, and sealants at about 100 billion euros currently. Um, and that they believe that about 10% of this can shift to digital application quickly once the technology is available, once people see the technology and trust the technology. Um, security printing currently is a, is a, you can look this up anywhere, a sort of 25 billion euro market. Um, growing the digital, digital part of that is growing fast. And additive manufacturing, whilst it's still quite small, only 8 billion euros right now, uh, the potential here is just, is just vast. It's enormous, currently growing 25% compound. Um, and you know, who knows where this will, where this will end up as, as, a sort of, as a future fundamental shift in the way everything is manufactured. So we think, uh, probably most people in this room are aware just how dangerous it is to try and predict uh, which analog market will go digital next and when it does and how quickly. Uh, so I'm being quite cautious here, but we, th you know, we think there's a market for 20 to 100,000 print heads in the relatively short term. Uh, with this type, the type of capability addressing the types of markets that I've talked about. Uh, and, and the status of our technology, um, we're carrying out uh, jetting trials at TTP, so many of our, our customers begin by uh, sending us fluids and uh, we, we do initial jetting trials just to see how close we are to being able to process them. Um, we're now making evaluation platforms available using the Pixtro LP50, which you may well not be available, uh, aware of. That's a picture of it. It's, a, it's a, produced by Mayer Berger, who have a booth uh, at the back of the hall over there. And they, they've been selling it for years as a kind of all-purpose inkjet R&D platform. You can buy it with any, anybody's print head attached to it. Um, we are modifying it to accept uh, our print heads, fluid supplies. That, as you can imagine, our fluid supplies are rather more complex uh, than is normal in terms of temperature control and sedimentation control. So we're equipping these systems uh, and uh, uh, starting to ship, the, ship them now to customers who want to play with our technology in their own labs, play around with fluid formulations and processes. And we hope to have uh, pre-production print heads available in the first half of next year. So that's where Vista is. Uh, please, uh, please talk to uh, Archipelago about their technology. They'll tell you all about it too. So I think that's uh, all I have. Thank you very much for listening. So close to lunch.